From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 318, recorded live Thursday, May 10th, 2012. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, training developers to work smarter. And now offering Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Pete Brown about making real stuff. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today we're talking to Pete Brown. Uh, Pete has been on the show a couple times before, and he's been on This Developer's Life. But Pete and I always have fun when we talk, so I wanted to chat with Pete today. How's it going? Uh, good. How are you doing, Scott? Pretty good. I just, um, just literally as we're sitting here, uh, got into my office, and uh, a Fitbit came in the mail. If you remember, I was playing with a Fitbit a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago, and it, and it died. Did you ever try a yep. Fitbit? No, I think my wife was interested in one, but, you know, my, my exercise is generally walking from upstairs to downstairs, my long commute to work. Right, yeah, my, my exercise is usually rolling out of bed directly onto my iPad. Right. <laughs> so, so did you, is this something you ordered, or just, like, random well, products showing up? I'm trying to, oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> there's always random products showing up at my house. No, I wish. Um, no, I just, uh, I, I just kind of rebooted my fitness life about... Three weeks ago, when when it got sunny, and yep. the thing is, man, you know how like nobody wants to admit that they have that stuff. It's called sad seasonal affective disorder, which is the I get depressed when it's not sunny disease, which well, is like you know. most of the year up there, right? Yeah, which is basically always right. But but man, when the sun comes out, it is just like dancing in the streets in Portland. I tell you. <laughs> There was a there was this amazing um, science fiction. I can't remember who this was. It was a science fiction short story that that they made us read when I was in eighth grade, and it was so unbelievably powerful. It was about these kids who all live on Venus, and it rains always. And when I mean always, I don't mean just twenty four hours a day. It rains twenty four hours a day, three hundred sixty five days a year, or whatever a Venus year is, always. And every I think eleven years. The sun comes out and it stops raining for like ten minutes. So the the the, the first part of the beginning of this uh, short story is the building up of this. It's depressing and it's raining and they've lived their entire lives and they've only ever seen clouds and rain. And then the sun comes out, but there's this little girl that they're really mean to, and without thinking, on the day that the sun was going to come out, they lock her in a closet. And she ends up, yeah, and she ends up seeing only like a sliver of sun through the door and then comes out like as the sun is gone and then she has to wait 11 years to see the sun again. Wow, you just totally made me sad. I'm picturing, well, that that made me sad, but so we'll need to, it can only go up from there, right? (laughs) No, that made me, when I was in eighth grade, that made me cry like a baby. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm picturing like Seattle and Portland, that whole area up there, like some big 80s song and dance number, you know, like everybody's <laughs> out in the street and confetti and throwing up their hands and stuff. Yeah, that's pretty much like it. It's like that. Yeah, that's what no, I thought. But, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, I'll give you an example, though, of something extremely Portlandy. Uh, we were, um, <laughs> this is like a classic Portland. I don't know how it works for, like anywhere else in the world because I've only ever lived here. But um, uh, my wife's in school right now, so I watch the kids on the weekends. And it was a Saturday. And I was like, okay, boys, what do we want to do today? And they're like, I don't know. What should we do? So I go to like this PDX. PDX is the code for Portland. I go to this PDX calendar website. And it says, oh, there's a pirate scavenger hunt today. I'm like, okay. And it's in the Hawthorne part of town. And Hawthorne is the most uh, granola part of town. So right. like you're more likely to see a lot of white people with dreadlocks and sandals and, mo- and bare feet than anywhere else in Portland. It's just a very cl- classically Portland place. And and pirates, apparently. Yeah, so we go there, and it is literally a pirate uh, scavenger hunt. There are, like, adults, full adults, dressed like Jack Sparrow, wandering the streets, looking for stuff. And it's all coordinated by this um, this dollar store. And basically, the idea was they wanted you to visit all the local businesses. And then every local business had a challenge. 
And the challenge was in uh, basically related to you knowing their product. So it's like, you know, go to the futon store and find three pieces of pirate gold and they're, you know, hidden under the futons that they want to sell. But the kids just loved it. And everyone got to dress as a pirate and get pirate booty and candy. And it was just cla- like a, just a classic Portland thing to do. But you can only do that for the 12 days of the year that it is sunny in Portland. So anyway, it got sunny. And suddenly I got all the energy in the world and all the vitamin D. Decided to start working out in earnest again, trying new diabetes medications and like really working out. I mean, I work out, but now I'm really working out to the point where I hurt. Right. Not sure if that's a good right. thing or not. So then I'm like, well, my Fitbit had been broken because I washed it. Uh, that'll my, usually break it. Yeah. Yeah. So I washed my Fitbit and now I went and got a new one because they have a new Fitbit. It's called the Fitbit Ultra. So it's a, a wireless pedometer that uh, watches your your background movement. It's effectively a gyroscope. And what's Cle- nice about it is that you, you don't have to dock this? it if you don't want to. It just picks up the data by walking by your computer. Right. So I'm guessing that you plan the washing of the old one just to get the new <laughs> one and have an excuse for your wife? That would uh, That would not be true, but I could totally see where you would think that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think you're just saying that would not be true because you're afraid she'll listen to this podcast. Okay, that, that's That fine. is very possible. Considering that she has been on the show now, there's, there's, it's very possible that she might get me in trouble. Right, right. But, uh, but the point is that you got to understand that I'm plugged into uh, an insulin pump, which is, is doing stuff to me 24 hours a day. So the idea of like plugging something into me to get more data is totally reasonable thing to do. Like everyone should yeah. do that. You're like just shy of being an access point at this point. You know, actually, I am an access point. I have a, I have a clear 4G hotspot that I put in my bag because I keep <laughs> using more than four gigs on my iPhone data plan. So it's on most of the time as a way to keep me from going over. Okay, if if the pirate thing didn't have people screaming nerd at their um at their speakers here, then I think that maybe just did it. Yeah. Well, the next part is that um, I used allowance to buy the uh, the Withings scale. It's a Wi-Fi scale. Oh, that. Yes, I saw that. It was at like um, one of the big trade shows. And I thought, who on earth would buy one of those? And I think I have the answer now. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> See, and, and when you're making the argument to the to the wife or the uh, or the spouse, it's like, uh, but, but it automatically recognizes the user. You know, like that, 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 like from my perspective, that should be enough to sell it. But it right, knows who right. you are. You know, it's like it's like buying a more expensive car because it has preset power seats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what does it do? Like, can it? Can you program it to like insult you and stuff, or motivate you, stuff like that? No. Although, interestingly, if you go to the website and you look at their clip art, when you show up there, there's a picture of the scale, and and then the LCD screen says "Hi, H I." Yeah. Which I immediately took to mean. You're too fat. I can't even give you a number, so I'm just going to put the number high. <laughs> tilt, tilt. Yeah, I, that's because exa- that's what an insulin pump says when you oh, go right, over yes. 400. It's like, yes. no, I, I have no idea. You're high, like you know, stratosphere. So, tips for listeners: Don't ever greet you with just a high. It should no, be hello. Just walk up to me and just say hi. I'm going to immediately take insulin, and that would be right. extraordinarily bad. <laughs> so the thing that I thought was interesting about these is not just that I'm. Uh, if, you know, a fat person getting less fat, but more that it's body hacking and hardware hacking. And I know you have an interest in that kind of stuff. And it made me wonder if, if these things had open SDKs that you could plug into, wouldn't you be more likely as a geek to want one? Oh, heck yeah. You know, it's, it'd be almost worth getting some of the diseases that some of these <laughs> things treat just so you can, uh, what, you know, hook up these tools. Just like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm eating this cheesecake because I need diabetes so that I can exactly. buy the scale so that I can hack into it. <laughs> exactly. It's for science. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if they have like open protocols and stuff and, you know, it's safety factors aside because, you know, that's that's a separate issue. But um, like one of the things I always like, what was that that sleep device that you and I both tried that we had oh, like on the, the Zio, Z-E-O. The Zio. Like I, I wanted stuff like that that you could hack like i wanted it to be able to send data to things of my choosing and i don't know what the heck i would do with it figure out what i'm dreaming about at night maybe but uh you know i wanted i i want stuff like that that i can hack into i mean having it be open hardware and having it be uh you know open protocols and stuff is a big deal for these devices 
I don't I don't understand why this isn't the immediate first obvious thing. I mean, people go and build these companies and then build a, a whole website around it and a whole data system around it and all these things. Why why do that? Why not build it and say, look, I have some open hardware. You guys go and build the website. Because the Fitbit guys have been fooling around with their website, trying to get it right for a long time, you know, a couple of years. Yep. And it's just not very good. The The product is amazing, but the, the website is meh. So other people have hacked into their stuff and made better, you know, better Fitbit sites, like the alternative sites for you to look at Fitbit stats. Right. They would have done that had you just said, hey, FYI. The, you know. Some companies, and, and I don't know what Fitbit's background is and like where they came from, but some of these hardware companies totally get that and they start off that way. And then you get sites like, um, uh, Patch Bay, right? It's P-A-C-H-U-B-E. Okay. That sort of grew up just for, uh, just for that reason to make it so everybody can connect their devices and stuff to it. But no, seriously, some do. And you'll find a lot of those on Kickstarter. That's one of my favorite places to hang out lately. But then other other ones just have that kind of old school mentality around, you know, they need to provide the whole product. And maybe that's what most consumers want. I don't know. Well, Kickstarter, I mean, man, every it seems like everything innovative is coming out of Kickstarter. Have you seen the Pebble Watch? Uh, no, I haven't seen that. Oh, great. Google. Oh, wait, or is that the, um, no, go ahead. No, this is the, the, so this is the tragedy of Microsoft too, is that, you know, they, they come up with all this amazing Microsoft research stuff. We even bring products to, to, uh, to market. And then like, it's like the standard Microsoft thing is one year after we come out with an amazing innovative product and then shut it down. Yeah. Someone else comes out with the same thing. Everyone's like, it's amazing. It's the phone. A watch, a smart watch. An internet connected yeah. smartwatch? It's a brilliant idea. You know, yeah. after having spent the last year crapping on the smartwatch. Yeah. So 10 well, years ago or whatever it was that we first came out with the spot watch, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it, the Pebble it's, it's, watch is this watch and this is, it's really brilliant. Uh, you can see it at get pebble, P E B B L E. Uh, and it just hit $10 million on Kickstarter. No kidding. Ten million dollars. Mm. That 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 was their original goal was a hundred grand. Let's see. Okay, they have. Oh yeah, this is that e paper watch. Yes, right. very. And this cool. is what's great. So it has e paper. So it's effectively a Kindle screen, yep. which means that it's going to have a longer battery. Yep. It hit a million dollars in twenty eight hours, and wow. uh, they're going to have an SDK for it, and they're going to have like you can control music with it, and they're going to have different apps you can download. They just have some different ideas like range finder and run. And of course, you know, plugging it into my, my blood sugar, my pump is going to be the first thing I'm going to want to do. It's oh, un- yeah. Unclear if I'll be able to do that, but, uh, you can try. Yeah, I can try. Exactly. Right. Yeah. This, I remember seeing it thinking this was gorgeous. I, for some reason, was this the one that needed an iPhone to program it? Was that what it was? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think that now it's going to support Bluetooth 4, and then the presumption is it will, as long as it talks Bluetooth, anyone could do anything and talk to it. Okay, well, that's very cool. Yeah, totally. I just think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. Didn't you we buy have this a weird... TI watch of some kind? I do. I've got the, um, the, the TI watch sitting in the back, uh, in my closet here, but, it was, they had a lot of stuff that was kind of proprietary about the, you know, use their compilers and their SDK and the kind of the usual microcontroller thing. So I just haven't had a chance to do much with it yet. But I got it when they were, you know, it was one of those things you, you said you went to this conference and you got it dirt cheap. So I did that and I got it, but I haven't done anything with it yet. Right. I think it was like $19, right? It yeah. Was... It was crazy cheap. Yeah. And the idea was that it's an open SDK, and then the, the TI watch that you that you and I have was really just a um, uh, a prototype in the sense of like, here's a playground. What if we What if we were coming into the watch world? You know, what yeah. would that look like? And it was one of their sort of dev kits for one of their processors. I don't remember if it was the Stellaris or or one of their other processors, but I think that was sort of the big the big thing about it. It's like here's a cool idea for how you could use our processor. Right. Right. The interesting thing about buying something on Kickstarter is the is the kind of the the dream of what it could be. Yep. Because you know they have a great, really polished video, and they've got a prototype that they've kind of 
rotoed out of plastic and they've built up and they're off trying to figure out how to build this thing. But it's it's unclear if it's going to be everything that we've dreamed, but the vision people have paid into, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I have funded a number of projects on Kickstarter. I think you have as well, because there's just, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff on there, not just from kind of open hardware, uh, which is definitely very cool, but even like there was a local band that wanted to get a CD done and I, I sent some funding their way and a, a kid's monster alphabet book. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff on there. How, what what's the average price that you've been paying? Um, I it, it depends on what the reward is, but it's usually like twenty ish, you know, for different things. Yeah, interesting, because the the thing with Kickstarter is that like I was explaining Kickstarter to a friend recently, and they were like, "Well, so are you investing?" And I was like, "Well, I'm kind of investing. I mean, I'm investing in the way that um, I, I am I am pre ordering." And in, in the pre-ordering, I am expressing my confidence that this is going to be awesome, right? Yeah, and that's exactly the way I use it. Because my wife was like, what, you're giving people money, you're like you're acting like a VC here and you're not getting anything in return, right? And I said, no, no, no. I'm generally only funding things where I'm getting something reasonable in return. So, yeah, I'm totally kind of mercenary about that. Right. You're, you're, funding, you're funding their dream, but it's not like you're giving them thousands of dollars right it's it's not like a vc right. or an like it's funny actually a lot of people have been calling themselves an, like angels like yeah. I, I noticed like tim ferris is like i'm an angel investor so apparently if you give someone 25 grand or 50 grand you can be a, an, an angel now which i think is a lot of money but i don't think of my you know i don't think of someone being an angel investor if they're giving someone on the order of thousands of dollars as opposed to giving them i don't know a couple of hundred grand or something like that Right. But am I an angel investor because I spent a hundred dollars on a on a pebble? A yeah, pebble I, I see what Probably you're not, at, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm just looking at like some of the projects I funded here and it's like um like the Atari history book, right? That um shoot, Ooh, that I can't remember like the idea. Yeah, I mean this one has already been funded and it was um who's working at Kurt Bendel and Martin Goldberg, right? Okay. So that's really cool book. It's like the comprehensive history book of Atari, something that would not get printed without this kind of funding. And you know, you're getting a copy of it. And then there's a the layer of the clockwork book, which is a nice book that has like a foil printed cover and hand drawn steampunk illustrations and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff on here. I'm looking, I've backed twenty some odd projects. Have have you received any of these yet? Uh no, actually, because I've only been backing recently. So I'm looking here. Oh no, I did receive the the CD from the local uh, band, which wasn't bad. Um, but I haven't received a bunch of other stuff yet because most of these seem to take, I don't know, six months from the time that the you give them the money before they actually get something in production. Yeah, or longer like, even. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I have done a lot of Kickstarter stuff, but I haven't received really anything. You know what I mean? Other yeah. than emails with updates of what they're working on. It's, it's it's hard to put together a piece of hardware, a hardware product. Oh, yeah. I mean, like the the Monster Alphabet book, which is, you know, just a book with a lot of nice hand-drawn, hand-illustrated alphabet stuff for kids. I'm hoping my kids don't outgrow it by the time I get it. But mm -hmm. that, um, like, I just finally got an update from them that they've got their boxes of books in and are going to start shipping it out soon. So so that could be kind of cool. The, the hardware projects on there, it, unless you're doing something like really populous, like yet another iPad holder, which there mm -hmm. are always zillions of those on there. They, they seem to have um, difficulty getting funding. A lot of those, like some are just plain cool, but then there are other things that are really kind of niche that are, that are taking a while to take off. Like there's, there's one here. There's, there's the play surface, which is um, basically a surface, right? This guy's got it on here and he's, uh, offering kits to build your own surface. Okay, and it's going to take like a, a good bit. thing. How much is that? Um, well, see, the, here's the thing: is it's there. What's it? 150 if you want uh, PCB, 250 if you want PCB and electronics, and it starts to get fairly expensive. Mm. So, like, this is one that I think is a really cool idea. But I look at the cost and think, well, you know, that's not kind of in line with what some of the other projects go for. I mean, because I think the things that are really successful are the projects where you're getting, you're, you're not only funding these guys, but you're actually getting a pretty good deal up front 
because you funded them. Exactly. You know, the ones where it's like, here, you're also going to fund our R&D costs tend not to do so well, even though you would think that would be the idea behind it. Well, that's what I thought was great about the Pebble was that it was $115, which is a little expensive for an electronic watch, but, you know, definitely cheaper for than that, it's going to no end way, up that's being awesome. when it shows up in Target. Yeah, I, I think that is uh, $115 seems like a reasonable, expensive gadget price for something like that watch, I would say. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of what I'm counting on. Uh, have you noticed any of these guys using like Arduino or Netduino or these different kind of like gadget uh, assembly kits, or are they doing all this stuff custom? Yeah, some of the kits are like Arduino and stuff I've noticed. I haven't, I, I did fund early on, but it didn't go through one project that was a .NET micro framework board. But quite honestly, I mean, NetMF is a much smaller audience than Arduino or something is. So those, it's really hard for them to get funding on something like this. Um, but, but I've noticed would, a bunch of would them they out know there. That? Would I even have to know? Like, would the Pebble be based on that? And I would have, I wouldn't even know what was inside it. Um, usually they'll tell you, like, they'll say, hey, you can program it in X, Y, or Z, right? So it kind of depends. And then there's, yeah, I mean, for the ones where they aren't telling you, I don't know. I like, like there could, there could be ones out there, but it seems unlikely. I mean, most of the ones where they aren't telling you what's inside it, they're usually, they just have a chip and they're coding it in C, right? Doing it, doing it from scratch. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be, um, the haven for like, open source stuff not not so much software as you know open source hardware and open mm -hmm. open source designs like that's always a big selling point like they'll that'll be part of the title you know open source whatever like open source cnc machine open source um you know microcontroller and so that's obviously a very important thing there and also um inventables has started getting into this as well where uh, Inventables was a site that always just had kind of interesting things on there, but now they're doing a little bit of a Kickstarter model where you basically pre-order things, and if the pre-orders get up to a certain number, it starts the factory, and they start making the stuff. What is Inventables? Um, if you go to Inventables.com, I'm, I'm, right. I presume that I could go to the website and find out, but what? Oh yeah, what is yeah. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, <laughs> that, Scott, you, you need to learn to the internet. In, sorry, go to your browser. Type in G O O G. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Start run. Um, yeah. So, but if, um, if you go there, so they, Inventables has lots of really just kind of unusual pieces of material and stuff that you can use to make things. Like they'll sell you, um, plastic that will keep its shape after you've put it in water for a second, right? Like, you know, just like sheets of plastic that you can deform and then heat up and then they keep their shape. Or there'll be like other bits on there, like, um, um, like maker slide type stuff, which is a, you know, an aluminum extrusion that you can put, um, V groove wheels on and kind of make linear motion stuff out of, right? So they have a lot of things like that and putties and just kind of really random things that companies have produced, but are typically only available in really large quantities to, um, you know, to regular manufacturers. You can go there pay more for it, you know, because you're not buying it in quantity, but you at least have access to it. Hmm. Um, but they have, again, started putting together um, like real projects and kits. There's a CNC machine on there. There's a 3D printer. Uh, I think there's a laser um, uh, laser cutter on there and some other stuff where if the orders get to a certain number, then they're able to go and start the factory, as they call it, and pre-order the things and get them to everybody. So kind of cool stuff. I'm glad that you brought up... Uh 3D printers, because I was over at Stir Trek, which is a conference in uh, Ohio, a couple of days ago, and mm -hmm. I saw my friend Bill Steele, who quit Microsoft a while back, he kind of retired, and is now working on marketing 3D printers. And uh, you know, we, you and I talked very briefly a while back about 3D printers and the concepts behind 3D printers and stuff like that, but I don't think I really got, I don't think I really got it. And then I saw it print stuff and then yesterday my son's um bicycle uh broke the uh, what do you call it the pedal fell off mm -hmm. and the, it was and i looked at it and it's like the molded kind of injected molded plastic pedal fell apart yep and i said to myself well this is like a it's like a ten dollar bike it's like a you know it's like a target disposable bicycle but right. i don't want to go and throw away this bike 
yeah. just because this thing broke. But I'm thinking to myself, this would be the perfect scenario for a 3D printer. I could just print him a new pedal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then there's all the, you know, the action figures that aren't out there that your kid wants. Suddenly you're printing action figures in the, in the basement and other toys and uh, um, adapters to go between Lego and, and connects and Tinker Toy and everything else. So all right, there's, there's just tons of stuff you can go do with a 3D printer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have one? Have you made anything with 3D printers? I, I don't have one yet. So I'm, I, I kept going back and forth between buying and building and they're expensive enough that I'm like, wow, I don't know that I want to spend that kind of money on buying one. But then a lot of the build ones out there aren't really what I'm looking for. So I'm sort of in that weird limbo space where I can't make up my mind. Uh, and I really just need to go and do something one way or the other. Yeah. Um, well, my buddy says that he, he'll sell them for, uh, a thousand dollars. Isn't that a good, yeah. is that, is that a good deal? Um, a thousand dollars is uh, about right for like the mid range stuff. I think rep, like rep rap, which it looks like from the picture I saw, he's kind of based on, um, is anywhere between, you know, four hundred and a thousand dollars, depending upon how much of the stuff you make yourself versus buy. And then the maker bought, uh, their new one, the replicator mm-hmm. is like seventeen hundred if it has one print head and two thousand if it has two print heads. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's Ultimaker, which is another one which is really nice and very fast. And that's like, uh, what's, I think it's about $1,300. But then this, you have. This all sounds like a lot of money, but I know I spent $1,000 for my first laser printer. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it really is a lot of money. Like, it's a lot of money to part with all at once, but the utility of something like that is just amazing. Like, I think more than a CNC machine and more than just about anything else, I could see that getting use. And not just if you have kids, because. I don't know about you, but I would definitely be making tons of stuff for my kids. I think they would find it cool. And I would probably even stick it upstairs on the table and let my kids design stuff themselves. Um, because it's, it's just that easy to use in a lot of cases here. But there's also just, you know, little things that you need, like people make holders for their headphones, you know, um, just little like adapters that you might need that might cost you hundreds of dollars to say attach a camera to a microscope or something like that. Right, right. Well, the idea that I like so much about it is that I can ship something from overseas and pay Lord knows what for all the shipping and the gas and all that kind of stuff. But if I, if everyone had a uh, a 3D printer, they could just say, "Oh, I need a comb. I'm going to print a comb." Yeah, right? and but, you know, but in this case here, waiting. man, I could just imagine like a, a, like five years from now, maybe even three years from now, we all have 3D printers, right? And this pedal falls off of my son's bike. I go and, and, and scan the broken pedal with an iPhone app. Maybe I point it at the pedal and it, and it gleans that it's 3D, figures it out, right? Yep. And then repair it digitally and then print it out. Or I mean, you I, go I to some, or you go to like a manufacturer website or you go to like some, uh, um, a place like uh, Thingiverse or something and somebody else has already designed one and you just download it and print it, right? So that's actually where folks are getting a little concerned that the lawyers are going to start stepping in because they've kind of stayed out of it so far, but you know, they're not going to stay out of it forever. Do you think that, do you think I'll be able to go to Office Depot in five years and buy a 3D printer? Or is there too Uh, much calibration and too much complexity? Well, there are several out there that are starting to be very like, like just plug it in and it works. So I don't know about five years, but I can definitely see this happening because they're already online. You can buy some that, um, you just, you bring it home and that's it. And then there is, there's one that's specifically meant for kids where it's completely sealed. It looks kind of like a toaster almost, you know, and it, it's got a little window in it. You can see what's going on. You upload the design and that's the end of it. So, um, I could definitely see this stuff becoming really mainstream. I mean, laser printers certainly weren't mainstream for a long time and color printers weren't mainstream for a long time. Um, and this is far more enabling than any of those things. Is it, is this the beginning of that kind of replicator from star, star Trek where it's just like, I need this. And then you just say, go ahead and give it to me. Cause like right now they're all kind of plastic and they're one color. And unless you want to switch the ink out or the, the ink rather, but the, the plastic stuff in the middle, it's going to be all one color. But could you imagine uh, where they'll figure out mixing? And we'll be able to go and make, like, print an action figure? 
Yeah, I I do think that we're we're getting there. Like the commercial ones can do that because they use sort of like an inkjet almost technology that's in like a powder bed, mm-hmm. and they can already do multiple different colors and and um, print all that stuff. Right? They also have ones that do printing of metal, and then I saw something where there was a three D printer that not so much 3D, but at least it can, you know, do 2D, was putting down traces on a circuit board. So you could print a circuit board, you could print all the hardware that goes with it. Um, I'm not sure how much hand assembly would be required afterwards, but it's definitely getting to the point where you'll be able to just plug something in, say, you know, I want um, some new Star Wars action figure, and it prints it out. But the the real big question for me is going to be, you know, what, ha- like, what happens with the companies in this? Are they going to start making available as a product, like a downloadable design? And there's going to be some legislation that says you can print it once and then it disappears. Or you like, how is that going to be handled long term? Right, right. Or if you, if I print it in Oregon, there's no sales tax. But if I print it in, you know, whatever, there is sales tax. I mean, that, you know, whether or not you can copyright these things and how much people can share them and stuff is starting to become a concern with different people. And the hope, of course, is that it's going to be open for a long time. But, you know, think about how the software industry started way, way back and kind of most everything was open for a while. And then eventually you started getting, uh, you know, a lean towards far more proprietary stuff. And um, that made it much more consumer friendly. Because everything was in a box and you got it, but you did lose freedom as part of that. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I must say though, I can't think of a time that I've been that jazzed about something though. I mean, the idea that I could print, like replacement parts was the most attractive aspect of this. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Because the boys are always breaking something. Yeah, and you could presumably, um, you know, you could print uh, plastic jewelry. There you go, right? Or if you get the ones that can print metal, eventually then you could certainly print all... I, I, you can print just basically anything. Could could you? Like, isn't there a limit of size? Like, if one of the boys broke an arm on an action figure, they, you know, they have like... They have, like <laughs> uh, it's a good thing you added on an action figure. For a second, I thought you were asking about printing a replacement arm. No, no, I'm just thinking like, you know, small stuff, like that has yeah. uh, real detail. So the the latest MakerBot will print something that I believe is about the size of a loaf of bread. So no, but that's, that's pretty that's big. big, though. I want to print yeah. something that has a lot of detail, like the fingers of an action figure. Yeah, so the, a lot of the, the current printers that um, basically melt plastic and extrude it out of a nozzle, they mm-hmm. do have an issue where they're only going to get um, so fine a resolution because it's, it's building things up with just layers of plastic. And when you look at them, you can actually see the kind of the stair stepping on it. Mm-hmm. But there are other technologies and there are some open source projects uh, as well as um, some closed source projects going on where instead of extruding a plastic they're hardening a liquid resin so they have a a um uh, like a projector like you would use to project you know stuff at a presentation right and they have this resin that will harden at certain um wavelengths of light and so it basically uh, projects the picture on the top of that that layer hardens and then the whole thing moves up some tiny fraction of a millimeter and then it prints the next uh the next one and so the resolution there is roughly the same as a projector. So, you know, 1600 by whatever over, say, like five inches by five inches. So wow. those are, you know, if they might have a very, very fine texture, but they're absolutely going to be able to print fingers and, and do all that. See, that's pretty amazing. I might be a little early then. If I jump in now, this will be like, I'll buy a 300 DPI laser printer and then the 600 will come out like two days later. Like, oh. Uh, but you know how this stuff is. There's always something coming, and that's that's part of the kind of the paralysis that I have. Where I would really want one of those liquid resin printers, but also the liquid resin is really expensive, and you have a big vat of toxic resin in your house. Whereas the the um, the extrusion ones do a pretty decent job, but um, they aren't so toxic. There are some fumes given off as it melts it, but nothing like um, the the resin process does. And they're getting better every day. And if you get an open source design, most of those can be, um, you know, kind of hacked and modified over time to get better and better. Very cool. It's always fun to talk to you about building things, Pete. 
yeah, I, I love building stuff. It's kind of my my therapy to account for all the time I spend staring at a screen. Yeah, making things with your hands or making physical things that will exist uh, and can't be easily deleted is a nice right. way to get over uh, making things that will be obsolete next week. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thanks for talking to me today. Hey, thanks, Scott. Always fun. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.